with a review talk by Kate McGuire, and she'll give us a deeper insight into the explosions of supernova type 1A and how they evolve to supernova remnants. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, firstly, thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So yeah, I'm going to focus more in this talk on type 1A supernovae than the core collapse that Dan focused on in the last talk. And I'm also going to really focus a little bit more on the supernovae themselves and the explosions that we see in the first years after explosion, not quite out to the remnant stage. Okay, so one of the things we want to understand with type 1A supernovae is the type of stars that explode, that cause them to explode. So we know that they're very important in terms of understanding the cosmology of the universe in producing iron, they're the main producers of iron. Each one produces about 0.5 or 0.6 solar masses of iron per explosion. And so these are the kind of questions that we want to ask, and they're really important for understanding the late stages of binary star evolution. But one of the main problems that we have is, and I'm sure many of you are aware, we still don't really understand what type of systems explode as type 1a supernovae. So they're really, it can be based on two different classes. We can look at two different classes of type 1a's. Um, so the first progenitor scenario that people have put forward is the single degenerate case. In this case, you have a white dwarf, which is the primary exploding star. And this is what we, we're fairly confident that the star that explodes is a white dwarf. We can know this from the elemental products. But we don't really understand what the companion star is. So in this case, it's the red giant or main sequence star. But we also have what we call the double degenerate case, where we have a white dwarf companion star. And there are a number of different ways that the process and explosion can take place to make these systems explode. So one of the key things to note is that we've never actually detected, directly detected the progenitor stars of a type 1a supernova. So Dan talked about going back to look in HST archive for pre-explosion imaging for the core collapse, but that's not possible for the 1As just because the white dwarves are so faint. And so really what we're trying to understand and trying to, when we're trying to solve and answer this question of what explodes, we need to look for very subtle signatures. And people have been doing this for a couple of decades now. And I can say we really, I'm not going to have any conclusions and tell you which is the right answer at the end of this talk. But it's really something that people have been investigating a lot and it is quite difficult to figure out. Okay, and it's actually way more complicated. So this uh, shows just some of the progenitor models that people have put forward to try and understand how type 1a supernovae explode. So you could have a Chandrasekhar mass explosion. So this is the mass that we expect, a white, the maximum mass that a white dwarf can have uh, to be supported before collapse. So that you can get accretion from a companion star via winds or Roche lobe overflow. Over on the right here, you can have a double detonation scenario. So this is when you have a helium shell on the surface of the white dwarf. And then in some process, that helium sh shell is triggered to detonate. And then this causes a shock wave to run through the star and triggers the core to detonate. So we call it a double detonation because you first get the detonation of the helium shell followed by the detonation of the core. And so there are a number of different models then as well. You can have the mergers of two white dwarves. You can have these collisional models where you have perturbations by a third star in a, bi in a triple system. So the two inner stars can collide. Or you can have violent mergers where it's triggered during the merger process. And so the key thing I want you to take away from this is, and I'll discuss this in the talk, is dividing this between Chandrasekhar mass explosions and subchandra. So on the left-hand side here, both of these explosions uh, with accretion from a non-degenerate companion star, you get the supernova, the white dwarf, exploding at about the Chandrasekhar mass, or slightly less. And in this case, you get with the subchandra models, so all these mergers and collisions, the models that are put forward are significantly below the Chandrasekhar mass. And so this has implications for the nucleosynthetic yields that are produced and also different properties that I'll discuss. Okay, so what kind of observations can we take of type 1a supernovae to try and understand how they explode? So this just shows a light curve of a typical 1a. It arises in about 20 days and then decays away, the radioactive decay afterwards. And so out here, I've added this in for this particular conference um, because we're talking about remnants, but say, I don't know where people draw the line for including remnants, but say after about 10 years. Okay, so some of the different processes we can look at to understand how they explode. So people look for interaction between the white dwarf, uh, or the ejecta from the exploding star and a companion star. So we can look at early light curves. This really is probed in the first days after explosion, hours to days after explosion. 
We can also look at observations around maximum when they're easiest to observe because they're brightest. And so people have done uh, studies of the high velocity features and looked for polarization, which can tell you about the asymmetries in the explosion. And then when we get to about 200 days after explosion, we get to the nice phase where the outer layers have become transparent and we can see the core. And this is important for understanding both asymmetries in the explosion and also understanding the nucleosynthesis. We can also look for companion star interaction, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then really when we get to this phase, let's say maybe approximately greater than 10 years, we're looking at supernova remnants, and I'll discuss this at the end of the talk. Okay, so as I said, one of the key parts that kind of connects the supernova to the remnant stage is after about 200 days from explosion. And so at these phases, the outer layers have all become transparent. And what we're looking at is we're able to see the core. It's cool. The outer layers have cooled and we can see the core in the inner layers. And for a single degenerate scenario, if you have a massive star that the detonation occurs in the center, you expect there to be a lot of iron group elements produced. And so this is where you expect the highest density regions to be. Well, we can also look at other things at these phases too. So the first one I'm going to talk about is companion star interaction. So, so the idea here is these are four different panels. Uh, so this is the first and following on in time. So what you have is if you have the supernova exploding up here off the top of this panel one, and so then you have your main sequence companion star. So in this particular case, you're assuming that there's a main sequence uh, companion star, which has been get, transferring mass onto the white dwarf getting it close to the Chandrasekhar mass and then triggering the explosion. So when the supernova finally goes off, this main sequence star is just sitting, sitting there next, it very close by. And so the material runs into this companion star and it gets shocked. And so that's what you're looking at in these further panels. You can see that this material is interacting with this companion star. And people have done models of what you would expect the signatures of this to be. So you can see uh, in the early time light curves, you can see hints of bumps that are caused by just the uh, additional luminosity that you'd expect from this process. But you can also, there's also predictions of how much material will be stripped off the companion star. So if you imagine this was a hydrogen-rich star, some of that hydrogen-rich material could be stripped off and then uh, mixed in with the ejecta of the supernova. And so people have predicted that this <coughs> material have very low velocities, so between 500 and 1,000 kilometers a second. And they also can make predictions of how much material is stripped in this process. So if you have a helium star, the binding energy is higher, so you get not as much of the mass of this secondary star, this companion star being stripped. But if you have a red giant star, you have about 0.3 solar masses of hydrogen-rich material that's stripped off. And so one of the things we want to do is we can really look at these very low velocity uh, ejecta at late times. So we want to go and look at this in our late time spectra to see if we can see any signatures of hydrogen. And so if we see hydrogen, that suggests that there's a main sequence companion star. And that tells us about how this supernova exploded. So to do this, we went back with a sample of 17 uh, type 1a supernovae. These observations are very hard to make because the supernova fade very fast after maximum light. And so we need some of the biggest telescopes like the VLT with x user to really be able to get these observations. And so for this sample, which you can see here, so this is just an example of some of the spectra. So this is focusing on the H-alpha, where we'd expect, obviously, the strongest feature to be. Um, so this is the prediction in blue for 0.05 solar masses of material from uh, some modeling work that's been done. And this is the three sigma limit. So for these objects, for these 17 supernovae, we see no signs of hydrogen, this stripped hydrogen that was expected. And so from these constraints, uh, you can suggest that you can rule out all main sequence and red giant companions uh, for this sample of type 1a supernovae. So the simplest scenario, you would say, there's no hydrogen-rich companion star. They're all coming from two white dwarf systems. However, um, as I'll explain, there's other observations that point in the opposite direction. So there are a couple of ways you can get out of this and probably still have a main sequence or red giant companion star. You can have some kind of spin up of the star prior to explosion. That just gives you a longer time to evolve the secondary star away. And so it wouldn't be hydrogen rich at the time of the explosion. Or the hydrogen material may be there, but if it's not mixed in with the radioactive material, you may not be able to see it. And so it may, it may be present, but not uh, visible through these features. <coughs> 
Okay, so also using like time observations, we can look at the core nucleosynthesis. So this is one of the key things that differs between the Chandrasekhar mass explosions and the subchandras. So if you have a Chandrasekhar mass explosion, so it's exploding very near this maximum value, you expect it to be a very high central density just because the star is more massive when it explodes. And so if you have this process, you get more electron capture and more neutron-rich material. And the outcome of this is that you get more stable iron group elements in the spectra or in the objects. However, if you have a subchandra explosion, either you can imagine a merger, you can think that the central density will be much lower. So you, first of all, if you have a, some kind of subchandra, it's not as um, high a mass, so the density will be lower. And then also, if you have the explosion maybe off-center, the densities just aren't as high. And so the outcome of this is you get more radioactive nickel-56. So in this case, you get more stable material, but here not. And so what you can do, this can be used as a way to try and understand which type of uh, systems are exploding. So you can look for the presence of stable material. Okay, so this is what we did. We took uh, spectra at the VLT with X shooter um, in the range 200 to 430 days after explosion to look for the presence of this stable material to distinguish between these progenitor scenarios. So these are just uh, two spectra shown here. Uh, the spectra of type 1a supernovae at these phases are nearly completely dominated by iron group elements. So you have uh, iron 2 and iron 3 lines, a little bit of cobalt 3 that's decaying away. So in the supernova explosion, you make a lot of radioactive nickel 56. This is what the powers the light curves of type 1a supernovae. This decays away with time to cobalt and then decays away with iron. So you can see the half-lives of these are about six days and 77 days. So by the time you get to greater than 200 days after explosion, there's no radioactive nickel still present in the supernova ejecta. And so if you see any nickel, this has to be coming from the stable nickel that would be produced in these higher density regions. And so one prediction is that there's a nickel line in this particular region here uh, to the redward side. And if we see this, this would suggest that you're getting a higher central density at the time of explosion. So people have done uh, radiative transfer modeling. A number of different groups have done this. These are very detailed calculations uh, to look to try and match uh, spectral uh, models to the obser observations. So you can see overall, these are comparing models. Uh, generally, the black is the data, and then the different colors are the models. Um, you can see overall they do, pretty, they do a pretty good job at, uh, say if you look at this top one here, they do a pretty good job of recreating the iron group elements that are present. Um, however, one part that they do struggle with is trying to recreate this nickel region. You can see, now I will say this is using a W7 model, which may not be uh, the correct model, but you can see they do struggle even to get the widths of the features right or uh, the profiles that the features have. So what we wanted to do uh, while people were uh, running more models, because these are very time consuming, um, I, got, uh, I got frustrated that people weren't doing this fast enough. So we decided to come up with a simple way of looking at the presence of nickel in the late time spectra. And so what we did was a very simple fitting uh, using iron two and nickel two. So this, these are the features that we expect to be present here. So this blue, these blue lines are different nick, are iron, features that we expect. So we use the atomic data from C CMF, Jen, and John Hillier. And we use an assumption of LTE, which is not completely correct, but it's not too far off from what the models produce. And then this dashed, these dashed lines here are what we expect to be nickel. And so then we also, so these vits, they look, they look pretty good if you have the presence of nickel. And then we also ran them, not allowing any nickel to be uh, fit, and the fits are worse. So in these particular case, we think there is nickel present in these. It's very difficult to explain this. Uh, there's no, we've checked for other features that may be present, but it seems very unlikely that you're looking at anything else in this region to produce this uh, redward peak. So from this, we're able to make an estimate of the nickel over iron abundance. And this is important because this depends on, you can compare this directly to the explosion models. That's what, this is what's shown here, so I don't know if you can see this very well. This is the W7, it's a classical um, Chandrasekhar mass explosion model. Here you have another Chandrasekhar mass, the delayed detonation um, model. And then down here you have some sub-Chandra models, this shaded region, 
and also these dashed lines. So this is a model at a low metallicity, and then you have to increase the metallicity if you want uh, more uh, neutron-rich material. Uh, so more nickel is the way you do it in the subchandra. So you need to increase the metallicity of the progenitor star to get this nickel over iron ratio. OK, so this, just to summarize, that's the model predictions for the Chandrasekhar mass explosions. And this is approximately the model range for the subchandra explosion models. And so then when we put on the data, they do have large error bars. And some of them sit down here. But in general, uh, they're consistent with Chandrasekhar mass explosions, apart from a couple of cases which very clearly sit down in this range of subchandra. So I would say, I would caution overall, there's, there's a large uncertainty on these values. And the, obviously, it'll be done much better when people do the non-LT rate of transfer modeling, which is something uh, we hope to do quite soon and have ready. We have a new code uh, that's been designed in Belfast to do this. And so hopefully, the new explosion models will go into the code very soon, and then we'll have better answers to these questions. But I think it does highlight, in this particular case, it looks like there are Chandrasekhar mass uh, explosions in some cases. And this ties in with what you see from studies of remnants as well. So this is 3C397. It's a 1A remnant, I think. Um, so what people have done is they've looked at the X-ray observations of this particular remnant. And from that, you can measure the nickel over iron abundance. This is Suzaku X-ray spectrum of this particular object. And from this, it suggests a high mass white dwarf for the same reason. The fact that you see this uh, stable nickel material, which you don't expect to, all the radioactive nickel has decayed, so this has to be stable material. And from this ratio, it does suggest uh, that it's a high mass or near Chandrasekhar mass white dwarf at the time of explosion. There's also suggestions for Chandrasekhar mass white dwarfs um, from studies of a slightly larger sample of supernova remnants. So what you're seeing here is the metallicity as a function of galactic radius for some Milky Way um, supernova remnants, and over here, one in the LMC. And so this is where you'd expect it if it followed the metallicity of the region of the galaxy in which it exploded. But you can see in the case of a couple of these objects, they sit above where we would expect to see them. And so the idea here is that there's another process prior to the supernova exploding that can also increase the amount of neutronization and therefore the amount of stable material. And so this is a, just as the carbon is ignited in the white dwarf, you can get a process that's called carbon simmering. And it's basically, uh, it can last for 10 to the 5 years. And in this process, you can produce a lot of neutron-rich isotopes. And so people have done a study a day in 2014 to measure the calcium over sulfur ratio in 1A remnants. And from this, there's predictions of the level of neutronization. So more neutron-rich progenitors have a lower calcium over sulfur yield. And so from these calcium over sulfur uh, values, Martinez Rodriguez made these calculations of where you'd expect this to sit. And so in three out of five of these cases, you see uh, metallicity values that are significantly higher than where you'd expect to see them for their galaxy locations. OK, so one other thing we can look at with the late time spectra is asymmetry. So this is just a, a large sample of late time spectra of 1As. Um, these show the optical regime, and then this shows the near infrared. Again, they're all dominated by iron group elements, um, mainly uh, iron 2 and iron 3, and then the little bits of nickel that we see. But what, what I want to point out here is, if you can see it, so these are the rest wavelengths of the peaks of these features, the dominant features that are present. And so probably this one is one of the best to see. You can see that this is red shifted. So these are all at a rest wavelength. But even when you crack them for the red shift of the host galaxy, some are red shifted and some are blue shifted. And so initially you might think, oh, maybe we got the red shift wrong or something like that. But it is actually a real effect that people see. And so Kichi Maeda did a nice study in 2010 looking at a property of the maximum light spectra of type 1A, so the silicon 2 velocity. Uh, silicon 2 is the most dominant feature you see in type 1As at maximum light. And from this, you can measure the velocity of this silicon 2 feature. And then from the late time spectra, you can just measure this shift, this blue and red shift that you see in the late time spectra. So we've redone Kichi's study um, recently with higher quality data. And we see the same trend that Kichi originally saw. 
And so what you're seeing here is that if you have a red-shifted uh, nebular line, so these features at uh, late times, you get a higher silicon-2 velocity at maximum light. So this originally is quite difficult to try and understand. Why would these two things be connected? Why would the silicon-2 material that we expect to be a lot further out in the ejecta be connected to this iron-2 region? And so the main thing that people think must cause this, or the only one that we really think is realistic, is that there must be some kind of asymmetries in the explosion. And something about the way, if, if you can imagine, if the material is redshifted, so the bulk of the iron-rich material is moving away from us, then we see a higher silicon-2 velocity. And so there must be some offset. The silicon-2 velocity is pushed towards us, and then the iron group elements are pushed away from us. And so this seems the most likely explanation for this particular trend. And this ties in nicely with some of the explosion models. So people have looked at the polarization uh, signatures that you can get. So this is for a Chandrasekhar mass delayed detonation model. Um, it's from Ivo Zeidenzal, some um, simulations. And you can see if you explode a Chandrasekhar mass uh, white dwarf in the core, it's a roughly symmetric object. That's what you're seeing here. However, if you have something like the sub violent merger model, it's actually much more asymmetric. So you could imagine that the polarization signatures from this would be much higher, depending on what direction you're looking at. And that's what you see uh, in the model predictions for the polarization. However, this double detonation scenario, where you first have this helium layer detonating, followed by the shock wave triggering the core detonation, actually produces polarization that's roughly consistent with the observations, which is very low levels of polarization in type 1a supernovae. But it also predicts um, some changes because you expect the silicon tuba material to be uh, slightly produced more on one side than on the other. And this agrees with the previous study relating the silicon 2 velocities at maximum light to the late time iron 2 velocities. OK, and then one final new thing that was uh, presented at the AAS yesterday is one of the really nice things we can do at late times is look for CSM interaction. So CSM has been seen, so circumstellar material has been seen in some supernova remnants, type 1a supernova remnants. In the case of Tycho, there's very likely no CSM material present. But in Kepler, there's a couple of indications that I don't have time to go into now where you can suggest that there is likely CSM material or CSM. This is also seen in normal type 1a supernovae at maximum light. So these, uh, you see stronger sodium 1d features in some type 1a supernovae. We expect it to be present in about 20% of them from observational studies. And it's generally located at greater than 10 to the 16 centimeters from the object. So in a very small, or so in about 20% of type 1a supernovae, there's a very small amount of circumstellar material. You probably think this circumstellar material is more likely to come from the single degenerate scenario, if you can imagine you have a messy hydrogen main sequence star, you'd expect some of that material to be left over, whereas in the case of two white dwarves, this material is much less likely. So we decided after we saw this in 20, approximately 20% of type 1As, we'd go out and try and look for this at late times to see if you could actually see the supernova ejecta running into this circumstellar material. And so Melissa Graham had a study on HST uh, to take near UV imaging of 72 type 1a supernovae at about one to three years after peak. So significantly uh, longer than the stuff I was showing earlier. And the idea here is that if you're looking for interaction, you'd expect to see it in this magnesium 2800 feature. And so uh, she got a sample of 72 objects um, and we found a detection in one of the 72. So at 664 days after explosion, uh, this is the position of the supernova here, this is marked A. Um, you can see there's a sign of something there. So this is around the magnesium 2 feature. And so we went, when we found this, this was in October of just, yeah, 2018. Uh, so very recently, no, it must have been the other year before. It must have been the year before. Uh, we immediately, once we saw that there was this detection, Melissa reduced the data very quickly. And we went out and got spectra at some of the world's largest optical telescopes. We went to the VLT and Keck, and we took a disk spectrum. People took uh, radio observations. There were no detections in the radio. But we did discover this very strong H-alpha feature 
at late times in this type 1a supernova. So it looked reasonably normal. There was no signs of interaction at early times. But at late times, this H-alpha appeared and then slowly faded away with time. This is over, uh, that's what, 600 and something days up to about 700. So over about 50 days, this decayed away. So this is the first time this has been seen for uh, type 1a supernova. We detected H-alpha and calcium-2 emission. And then Chelsea Harris has done some modelings of modelling of this object. And you can constrain the CSM mass to be less than 0.5 solar masses of hydrogen. So it's not very uh, tight constraints. But we are seeing some CSM out there, which again does suggest uh, this material had to have been produced in this particular system and suggests a single degenerate scenario. OK, so my summary is um, incomplete, I would say. Um, I showed how when you have companion star interaction from these, the, looking for the hydrogen features in the late time spectra, uh, we saw none, which suggests white dwarf, white dwarf mergers or some kind of subchandra. If we look for stable material, uh, as has been seen in the remnants, we get the so, uh, solution that you would expect hydrogen rich, uh, Chandra Sekhar mass, white dwarfs. From the line shifts, we expect helium shell detonations of subchandra white dwarfs. Um, so I would say there's no conclusive evidence for a single channel for any of these, and it probably comes to the conclusion that maybe there is more than one way to produce a type 1a supernova. Uh, so how do we make progress on this? I think one thing that's been lacking to date is really combining observations of single objects from very early so we can get all these different progenitor uh, signatures of a particular object and see whether they agree or disagree for particular ones. And hopefully from that, we'll finally be able to solve this problem. OK, thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Do we have any questions for Kate? Dan. Kate, wonderful talk. I have a ton of questions. I'm going to limit it to one, and then we can talk afterwards. Uh, the line shifts. Mm -hmm. Did you choose a particular epoch for which the shift was measured? Because as I understand, that shift changes with time. Uh, yeah, so if you go back, oh, well, oh sorry, this is a fancy Mac. Uh, <laughs> You're so fancy, Antonio. It's got these, it's got the little pictures. Um, so if you look over here for these features, you can see that this one shifts with time. So this iron three peak. Yes. So if you look, these are ordered by phase. You can see the way that the peak of this shifts. That's what I'm familiar with, yes. But you're saying, though, that the... But if you look over the phase range for, say, this feature or this feature, they don't change with phase. Those are the lines that do not change. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, that's an easy answer. I'm going to ask yeah. one more, okay. Um, the fitting of the line, the nickel and iron, right? So clearly, because you ended up translating those measurements into abundances, right? So you made some assumptions about how it's distributed, temperature, all this, this yeah, things, right? Yeah, so uh, for this, we used uh, Anders Yerkstrand's uh, radiative transfer code at late times. We used the predictions for the departure coefficient to link between the LT and the non-LT uh, to get those values. Um, and yeah, we had to assume certain conditions on the temperature, but again, we took those values from what was predicted by the models and the range in the models. Starting with the W7 yeah. again? Uh, yes, they would have been for W7, oh, okay. oh, yeah. And so, so that gives the large uncertainties on the actual ratio, yeah. Do we have any more questions for Kate? If not, I might have one. I was wondering in the late time spectra, do you see any evidence for line asymmetries that could be attributed to dust or um, or is it hard to say? Just because it's yeah, it's been a, for a long time a question whether, whether there is dust. dust or so dust? no, we don't see any uh, signatures of it. There's no blue shift as you would expect if there was dust present preferentially because we also see these ones that are red shifted. But, but hey, yeah. Uh, if you show that H alpha profile, do you see how that was yeah. largely yeah. shifted? So is that a radiant transfer thing or what's contributing to that? Yeah, yeah we're not sure about that. That's, that's where you may find something. Yeah, that would be interesting to look at. Yeah.